Welcome back to the Just Cash Wellness YouTube channel, coming to you with another episode of the Fully Nourished podcast. I'm Jessica Ash, functional nutritionist and integrative health coach, and this podcast is really about taking a scientific and spiritual look at why everywhere you look, it seems like women are so deeply burned out on a soul level. Let's explore together what it looks like to reclaim our feminine radiance and become fully nourished in a world that seems desperate to dull women down. With that being said, as a reminder, everything in this podcast is intended as education and inspiration only and is not intended as medical advice. Please talk to the appropriate professional when necessary, and please also use some common sense when making any changes to your diet or lifestyle. All right, all right, all right. Welcome to episode two. I just want to say thank you so much if you made it through episode one and sticking with me through it all, through the nerves, through the rough spots. I really just needed that first episode to kind of get my wiggles out and get my nerves out. And podcasting is a little bit of a learning curve. If you've been around since circa 2020 or 2021, you know, the old jaw style Instagram stories where I would sit down. I would research a topic and I would walk you guys through it for a good a good period of time. There's still a lot of story highlights <laughs> proving that I did that. I really wanted these podcast episodes to be similar. Women really love them and I want this podcast to be similar. But it's been a while since I've sat down and done that. And so I'm a little out of practice. I'm a little rusty and I'm getting back. I'm getting back in the groove of things. So today's episode is titled Energy is Everything. And we are going to be diving into Bioenergetics 101, understanding what bioenergetics means, and just discussing the ins and outs of the energy of the body. And before you're like, Jessica, come on. You said this this podcast was going to make me feel lighter. That sounds like a really heavy topic. It sounds really unsexy. I just want to say, I promise you, I try to make it as sexy as possible. And I think I think it's pretty dang sexy. In fact, I have so much prepared for you that I feel like that girl in Pitch Perfect, the movie, if you've seen it, where she projectile vomits like a fire hydrant whenever she gets nervous. Well, that's what I'm going to do because I'm just so excited to share. And as we continue along in this journey of laying the foundations, as we're going to do throughout season one, you're going to see how every single episode kind of builds upon the last. So I'm going to start weaving. I, I have a very specific reason why I've laid the episodes out in the order that they're laid out. And I'm going to start weaving the themes from the last episodes into the current episode. So if you didn't listen to episode one, highly recommend you to listen to it because we talked about some really important points on authoritarian thinking and dogmatic belief systems. And if you missed it for whatever reason, you want a quick summary, I'm always going to just summarize the last episode just so you have a little summary or a little reminder of what we talked about. But what's happening a lot in the health and wellness space and what I see a lot of women struggling with, and it's really affecting their quality of life. And I have been there there too. I don't want to just point fingers. It's This is something that I have recognized and worked through in my own life as well. But I have noticed that women really take a dogmatic approach to nutrition. And it's, it's hard because in the society that we grow up in, there is an authoritarian structure in most places, whether that be the government, the school system, religion. We tend to think within blindly following authority and a negative viewpoint in the sense of we do things to avoid punishment or uh, avoid some type of bad thing from happening rather than having a very strong vision and working toward a very strong vision or goal, focusing on the negatives, aka the uh answers we got wrong on a test or the red marks we got versus what our passions are, what our giftings are, all of the things that we do right, all of the things that make us who we are. And so how this permeates into the health and wellness space is really that women tend to blindly accept or submit to who they deem is an authority. And Unfortunately, right now in our weird world, a lot of people think influencers are the authority on something. And so this often leads to them kind of creating this obedience to this arbitrary set of rules that they have in their head. They don't have a strong vision for themselves, so they're kind of looking to influencers. They're looking to people to 
create what that vision is for them, and they end up blindly obeying this set of rules at the expense of their own bodies and their own needs. Instead of listening to themselves and their own intuition, they just kind of do whatever the rest of the group is doing. And a lot of us are so brainwashed to think this way, we have a really hard time understanding that there are other ways of thinking. And I'm here to actually share the physiological reasons why this happens. I don't just want to discuss like the, the phenomenon of it happening, but I actually want you to understand why this is happening on a much grander scale and what's going on in our bodies to make us think this way. But this is why starting this series or doing this as one of the, the beginning episodes is so important. As unsexy as bioenergetics might sound or seem, bioenergetics really allows you to view the world in your body and your healing journey through a completely different lens and from a completely different perspective than most people do. And one of the things I love so much about you and the Just Cash Wellness community is that we are a collective of women who are really hungry to understand. You know, when you look at feminine nature, the female essence really does want to understand the mysteries of life in a way. We want to discover and unravel goodness and beauty and truth. And so we seek it out and we try to make light of what that truth is. And as much as the culture around us is not very good at mastery, I'm going to admit, you know, we've gotten so used to education and learning in quick video format. You know, we think we can learn something and master something within three minutes, as long as we just watch a few TikToks, like we're now an expert on something. We understand as a community that it takes more than that. Mastery takes more than that. And if we truly want to master something, we have to challenge our belief system. We have to look at it through a critical lens. And if it can stand up to criticism, then it is a powerful belief system. And that's what I want to do today. This is why laying the, the foundation of bioenergetics is very, very important. So I think there's a lot of confusion right now within the pro-metabolic space that bioenergetics and pro-metabolic are the exact same thing. They're often used synonymously. And I'm here to say that's actually not true. As you see the pro-metabolic diet, which I put quotations around it if you're not watching on video, as you see this diet become more and more popularized, you're going to also see a lot more misunderstanding of it and you're going to see a lot more criticism of it. And that's anything that is countercultural, that offers a different and new perspective. That's just normal. But I want to educate you to understand that there is a big difference between bioenergetics and pro-metabolic. They're not the same thing. And separating them is actually really very powerful in understanding the belief system or the perspective that bioenergetics brings to the body. Where pro-metabolic is more of an approach to enhancing our energetic potential through a nutritional lens, bioenergetics is kind of the umbrella that sits above pro-metabolic. It's the view of the body from an energetic perspective. And today's episode is not about pro-metabolic. That's actually going to be the next episode. I think it really warranted its own episode episode. And I promise you the next episode is not going to be what you think. It's not going to just be the same old, same old. This is an introduction to pro-metabolic. Um, it's going to be a really no holds barred approach to the ins and outs of what the pro-metabolic diet is, what it isn't, the myths, the misconceptions, all of that. So I'm, I'm really excited for that episode. But this episode is really about discussing bioenergetics as really almost a, an important philosophy or lens to view your body through. And how we view our body while working towards healing is extremely important. And I hope by the end of this episode, you are reminded how important it really is. And I think if we're honest, you know, when we look at what actually draws us to health and wellness, what actually draws us into our healing journey, a lot of times it's because we're trying to either focus on bettering our health. We need to outrun symptoms, right? We're struggling with some type of problem that we're trying to outrun. But I think somewhere along the way, what I'm noticing is so many women tend to get caught 
up. We ca- get caught up and it goes back into that those authoritarian themes of where we start to focus on these achievements, these arbitrary set of rules as a, this expectation that we need to achieve. And if we don't achieve it, we get like a, you know, a B minus on the test. We're trying to almost become perfect. We have this arbitrary goal of perfect health somewhere in the future, and it becomes this pinnacle that we start working towards. And I'm here to tell you that that's not something that can ever happen. We're never going to reach this pinnacle or we're never going to reach this perfect health. And so if we don't do a good job of defining what we believe about the body and what we believe about what we're trying to achieve on our health journey, we can run into that dangerous aspect of getting caught up and stuck in the rat race that becomes healing. And I think this is why we as women tend to become so susceptible to the the group think behaviors that come with these very restrictive diets. We we fall down the rabbit hole of restriction a lot, whether it be, you know, AIP or paleo or carnivore or keto or veganism or even the restriction within the pro-metabolic space, we tend to fall down these rabbit holes or these pathways because we don't have a solid perspective or lens in which to view the body. We have no goal, no vision to move towards. We're just kind of stuck in these rule-based systems that are keeping us running with no goal in mind. We're not really running towards anything tangible that we've defined for ourselves. And I think this is why you see so many women end up getting stuck or jumping from thing to thing to thing, or even think about these communities that define themselves by their, you know, I love, I loved that definition that I talked about in the last episode, woundology, or end up identifying themselves by their disease or identifying themselves by their symptoms or identifying themselves by their struggles. Because when we don't have a strong viewpoint in which to view the body, we have to be focused on something. And so we end up, because of human nature, we end up being focused on the most negative aspect of ourselves or outrunning our symptoms or outrunning our problems rather than having this beautiful vision to work towards. And that is what bioenergetics really gives us. Understanding bioenergetics really allows us to redefine our experience and our experience in health and our experience in wellness, but also the experience within our body. It completely shifts our perspective and how we approach our body and healing. So I want to start this deep dive into bioenergetics with how I start all of my research. And this is just a little insight in how I do research. Even if I kind of have a grasp on the definition of something or I think I understand something, I always like to start a set of research or uh, a set of study just by defining something, looking up the simple definition of it and making sure that I truly understand the definition and it kind of like penetrates my soul rather than just having a more brain or logical understanding of something. So when we look at bioenergetics, I think, you know, to me, it's really looking at the body through the lens of how energy flows through a living system and then how that and then looking at how that energy returns back and impacts the physical structures of the body or the underlying physiology. So really just how energy flows through the body and how that energy impacts the physiology. That's really what bioenergetics means. But when you look at that definition, it requires us to understand what energy is. And I think energy can actually be the harder thing to define. When we look at energy, there's a million different definitions of it. You know, science has tried to define what energy is. And you can look up all of the definitions in the world. Everyone kind of has a different take on it. But I've had to really sit with this for many years because I've been studying bioenergetics for a long time. And over time, it has really, the the idea of energy has expanded within myself. I don't want to say that, that my idea of energy has changed, but my idea of energy has become much more complex. Before, energy was just this thing that, you know, I felt where I felt energized or I felt tired, you know, or energy was kind of just this arbitrary thing that I didn't really define for myself. But as I've sat down, even just for this episode, to really ask myself, Jessica, what does energy mean to you? This has really blown my mind because when I think of energy and what it it means to me, you know, it really is the power or force that sets every living thing into motion. It's what makes everything that lives alive. And when you think of that, 
it kind of blows your mind because without energy, everything would be nothing. Everything would be dead matter. And then when you look in, you know, I've done a lot of research looking into what's behind energy. And there's so many researchers that have been able to see how the power or the force, the energy, also has its own sound or song, which sometimes gets referred to as vibration or frequency. But in reality, every living thing has energy behind it. And that energy impacts structure and gives off a sound or a frequency or a vibration. I have a few different resources that you can look into below, but I think of like Barbara Hero's work. She passed away in 2021, but she did this amazing research throughout her lifetime where she looked into the vibrational frequencies, the song or the sound behind so many different living things. And what she found is just absolutely incredible. And you can find her research concentrated on uh, her her website, Lambdoma, L-A-M-B-D-O-M-A.com. But what she found was behind every mathematical structure, every thing, every living thing from the organs of our body to minerals themselves, every single thing gave off its own song. And that song was a representation of its energy. You know, a lot of times these songs or these sounds get called vibrational frequencies and they are, they're vibrations, they're frequencies, they affect the structure of things around them. But this has been proven and it's so incredibly powerful to understand that. So when I, when we dive into bioenergetics and when you're understanding bioenergetics, it's really important for you to be able to define what energy is because bioenergetics is really looking at how energy flows through living organisms and, or, you know, in the the context of what we're talking about, how energy flows through the body and then how that energy that is allowed to flow through the body how that actually impacts the structure around it. And it's a very, very powerful thing. So the reason why I bring up authoritarianism a lot and I bring up this kind of blind acceptance is because I see this happen a lot within the pro-metabolic community and specifically the Ray Pete community. Now, I don't want to undermine or ever put down the amazing and incredible work that Dr. Ray Pete did. Because Dr. Ray Pete, he often gets referenced a lot in the bioenergetic space because he's the one that has the most research, has spent the most time diving into how nutrition impacts the energy flow throughout the body system. And his work is a great resource for studying bioenergetics and how to view nutrition through an energy-centered lens because nobody did the amount of work that he did in this space. He really had a very bold and unique perspective when it came to the body. However, he wasn't the only one that thought in terms of energy. There's many greats out there like Albertson's Georgie, Hans Selye, Dr. Gilbert Ling, um, Dr. Katharina Dalton, Dr. Tom Brewer that took aspects of bioenergetics into their work to really understand physiology. But he's really the one who did the most work regarding practical and theoretical ideas on how nutrition impacts energy flow. And, you know, his whole his whole life's work was really that energy begets structure or that energy and structure are interdependent on every level. And at the time when he started his research, his ideas were incredibly revolutionary. And as much as we have started understanding the importance of aspects of his work now in today's time, it still is very revolutionary compared to a lot of the nutrition research that's currently out there. His observations were that the environment is what influences how the body functions. And he really realized that there are environmental influences and demands on the body that caused a gap between our energy resources, right? The the resources that our body had to do the jobs it needed to do and the demands placed on the environment oftentimes would create symptoms and disease because there would be blockages in the creation of energy and the flow of energy. So really this revolutionary idea that 
we had a block in energy flow, and that's what causes our physical degeneration and aging at a faster rate, was revolutionary. And I still feel like it's kind of revolutionary as much as people have started to acknowledge the science of epigenetics and how environment impacts the expression of genes. It still seems that people are very much stuck in this viewpoint that they are living out the destiny of their genes and that because they just have bad genes they're kind of destined to what they're going through and this actually this idea within the medical field actually came from the idea you know in the early in the late 1800s and the early 1900s there was this idea that people were cursed and they would bring their curses in with them and of course we can dive into the nutritional aspects of it and the environmental aspects of it. And it makes way more sense that what goes on in people's lives, what we experience and our environment and what we eat and our nutritional wealth really, really impacts the expression of our genes. But the idea of just being cursed and not having anything we can do about it, being completely helpless to the situation is a pretty hopeless place to live. Because when we start to realize that we can fill the gaps that our environment creates between what our body needs and what the environment that we're living in demands upon our body, we can fill those gaps with nutrition and other habits. That means that looking at the body through a view of bioenergetics really gives us a lot of hope. Because when you take an energy-centered approach to the body, it allows us to focus on reducing the factors that age us faster or degenerate us faster, however we wanna look at it, and to focus on getting the protective nutrients, the nutrients that make us more resilient to our environment, and also supporting the protective benefits of our own system. There are many hormones and physiological processes within our own body that are protective against our environment and make us more resilient to our environment as long as we provide our body the tools and resources to do its jobs appropriately. So if you truly understand the concept of energy begetting structure, or the fact that energy and structure are interdependent on every level, meaning that the energy impacts the structure itself. You know, you think of water when energy is put behind it, you know, you take a big gong and you you hit the gong. It makes waves or vibrations or frequencies within the structure of the water. That's a great kind of analogy for energy impacts structure. And then obviously our structure impacts our energy flow because our cells themselves create energy. So we we have to look at them as interconnected. It's not one or the other. It's both work together to create both energy and structure. And one cannot exist without the other. But if you truly grasp this concept, it's amazing because it's such a hope bringing philosophy. It means that it's a momentum based approach. It means that the more you work on restoring your energy flow, the better your structure functions. And then the more resilient you become to your environment, which means you create energy better, your structure functions better. And then again, you're becoming more and more resilient. So it's like this momentum based approach where you focus on energy flow, your structure improves, you become more resilient and your environment impacts your energy flow less. So you get more energy. It's almost like this infinity type momentum structure. And I find it so hopeful because instead of focusing on running from something or Instead of focusing on keeping ourselves within this little box and maintaining this arbitrary set of rules, we can believe that our goal is to focus on protecting and expanding our energetic potential. And man, does that change the game. To me, that changes everything. Because if everything that I do adds to the momentum, adds to this beautiful kind of circular cycle, every time I add more and more energy and focus on increasing and maintaining my energetic flow, my structure improves itself and therefore I become more resilient. And then my energy just continues to improve. It's such a beautiful cycle and something so hope bringing that we can focus on. And so I want you to kind of remember that phrase is it's all about protecting and expanding our energetic potential. That's the lens I would love for you to view the body through. As we enter this kind of halfway point, or at least I hope it's halfway in the episode, I want to 
not only highlight that phrase, but I also want to enter this next part of the episode with a quote by Ray Pete, because I do want to honor his life's work. I think it's really, I think people kind of bastardize his work in a way. They just kind of blindly and uncritically accept his points of view, which is not what he wanted. In fact, he he encouraged the opposite. His His whole motto was to perceive, think, act, you know, look at your own perceptions of something, then really think about it and then act upon it. And I don't think he would want people just blindly kind of quoting him all the time and just kind of creating this echo chamber where all they do is what he said to do. I think his goal with his work was to create something foundational that we could build off of. And I loved his personality. I just loved his approach to life. And one of my favorite quotes by him, I'm entering this next half of the podcast with this quote, because this half of this episode is probably going to ruffle some feathers. And so he said, one of my favorite quotes by him ever is, I've never been a big party attender, but I never went to a party where I didn't probably offend most of the people there by talking about what I was interested in. And can we just take a moment to say, is, is that, is that not us? I mean, I think, I think that's me. So (laughs) I, I am sure you identify with him there as well. So now that I've warned you that I may, (laughs) I may offend you in this half of the party, uh, let's dive into what bioenergetics actually means for shifting our perspective on the body. Because I think we can understand bioenergetics from an intellectual level. That's kind of what we just went over. We went over the more left brain, masculine side of understanding bioenergetics. But as women, we really need to live in that more artistic point of view. We need to not only understand it in our head, but we have to be able to feel it in our body and understand it on a deeper, more spiritual level to really allow it to penetrate us. There's art and beauty to science, not just information or intellectualism. So now that we've looked at energy from such a masculine approach or a more masculine approach, let's look at it from the feminine side of things. Let's stand back in awe of the mystery of it all. So as I did research for this episode, I and I really pondered the idea of energy. I started thinking about, hmm, I wonder if there's any type of measure of energy or electricity that comes from the body. I'm just curious what type of energy or what type of force or motion our body can create on its own because we are these energy generators. And I was able to find this interesting article on MIT. And it talked about how in 2007, they took this tool, it's a nanoscale tool, and they were trying to measure the electrical fields inside of cells. And what they were able to find is actually crazy. They found that there were very strong electrical fields given off by every single cell in the body. Every single cell or the cells that they measured gave off about 0.07 volts of electricity. Now, that might seem little like 0.07, but remember, we have... 30 trillion ish cells in our body. So you take 0.07 and you times it by 30 trillion and it gets you a way bigger number. It gets you a number that I can barely even wrap my ha- my head around, which is 2 trillion 100 billion. Now to put that type of electricity into perspective for you, a bolt of lightning gives off about a billion volts, 1 billion volts of electricity. And the 2 trillion, 100 billion would be like 2,100 bolts of lightning. That is our electrical potential. That is the type of energy our body is generating at any given point when it's operating optimally. And so can you just take a second? 2,100 bolts of lightning, 2,100. That is insane. And and the reason I bring this up is because oftentimes we simplify our body into this like sack of meat. We think it's like this sack of meat or my favorite growing up was my faulty earthly body. That was that was one of my (laughs) that was one of my favorites, Um, you know, or we kind of try to simplify it into this stack of functional lab tests or working in a system of protocols or, you know, breaking it down and seeing it through the viewpoint of just the chemicals within it, or even worse, we break it down into woundology, our woundology. You know, we identify our body by its symptoms, by its shortcomings, and we proudly wear our dis-ease, you know, the dis-ease within our energy fields as an identity. And this is how we define our body. This 2100 
bolts of lightning, electricity producing being that we are. And we just kind of simplify it into something almost negative. But there is proof all around us that our body can generate extreme amounts of energy. So I like to take a spiritual approach to this as well, because I think it's really important for us to really grasp this concept. We have to see the spiritual side of it, regardless of what you believe. You know, this is kind of what I have concluded and I'm sharing it with you. That doesn't mean you have to believe what I believe. But I think that we have to add, we have to be able to see and perceive the spiritual aspect of our physical body to be able to truly grasp and accept how incredible we are. And if we think of energy as the underlying force of all that is, right, the the, the thing, whatever this thing is, the source of motion, the force of power behind all living things. And without this force, we would fall apart and die. We would be dead matter. It's important to also define energy in what it means to us. So for me, you know, I think of energy as kind of that unique hum behind all living beings. Everything gives off this hum, this sound, this mmm where we can feel it, we can sense it, you know, we get gut feelings about people, we have the ability to hear the hum. When the hum is not there, we feel it, right? Uh, whether that be in others or our own hum, we feel like we've lost a part of our life force. And I think of this hum as the life force behind all living beings. And when you look at the phrase, energy begets structure, you know, this life force, this power, this thing that puts it in motion begets everything that is. I see it as a synonymous phrase with God creates. Whatever the source of everything is, you want to call it God, you want to call it the universe, whatever you want to call it, whatever this thing is that's keeping everything of life the, alive, the source of it all, it is what is begetting the structure around us. Without it, everything would be lifeless. Everything would cease to exist because without energy, there is no structure. And I think of the phrase I always heard growing up when I grew up within the church. And I think, you know, at least for me, I, I notice how religion likes to just really not over not just overly simplify the body but debase the body degrade the body to turn it into this just sack of bones this thing that's going to dissolve into dust but i feel like that is so wrong because when i think of the phrase that i heard constantly growing up where god says i am like when he's asked who he is he says i am i thought that makes no sense i cannot wrap my mind around that that like what i am like what the heck does this even mean? And as I learn what energy is, that phrase, I am, makes total freaking sense now. Because if energy is the force, the thing that has set everything in motion, and structure cannot be created without energy, well, it's very quite simple to me now. Man, can I see it so clearly, and I don't know why it's been so overcomplicated up until this point. Why it took me, uh, all of you know 12 years of study to be able to understand this this way so whether you find as much meaning in that or not you know i'm kind of obsessed with the secrets of the universe i want to understand what is behind it i and i take a lot of the things that i learned growing up and i seek to understand if there's maybe a different perspective something that humans have done a really good job of messing up. And I often find that within science. I find a lot of the secrets of the universe. There's something outside of the laws of the universe that set the force in motion. And when I think of one of the basic laws of physics, you know, nothing can be created or destroyed. Obviously, there is something outside of this of the laws of the universe that started the deep hum or so sang the song that was needed to create the structure. And I find it quite interesting that if something outside of it all started at all, whether that meant, you know, if you look at a lot of the 
uh, I've read a, a lot of different texts from different religions and studied a lot of different creation stories or beginning stories from many different uh, tribes and cultures around the world. It's interesting because there are many different traditional cultures that believe that the world, everything that we know to be the universe around us started with a song. But not to get too spiritual on you, I the reason I bring it up is because I want to highlight that if nothing can be created or destroyed, right? Everything, all energy really reshapes and reforms itself. You know, we don't really have the the ability to create from nothing. We are able to create. We are these amazing co-creators with the creator of the universe, right? We have the source energy available to us and we can really, and we have these amazing bodies that are reshapers and reorganizers of energy. You know, we have this unique gift of taking matter and transforming it into something else. It's really quite cool to look at uh, from a smaller, you know, from a kind of a smaller viewpoint is we are able to take food and generate sound, electricity, heat, right? We maintain a 98.6 degree body temperature, you know, and and science often simplifies this concept into our mitochondria, creating ATP, but it's really us being these energy reshapers or reformers. We're able to take food and our environment and things within our environment and reshape and reorganize energy so that we can continue to generate all this heat and electricity. It's really quite fascinating. And on a more grander scale, you know, our body can take nutrients and these this energy and it can actually create life, at least in the, in the case of females, we are able to actually create a whole nother soul with this ability to reorganize or reshape energy. It's, it's really mind blowing to me. It's, it's, it's seriously crazy. And no matter if you want to acknowledge the spiritual aspect of it or not, if that kind of turns you off or you're not really into it, that's totally okay. I, t I completely understand. There's times where I have not been into that at all. I was actually turned off by it as well. And we're going to talk about the real physiological reasons why that might be later on in this episode. So please stick with it. Don't get too turned off. But this is really why cellular function and metabolism it is really the root cause of it all. Because when we're talking about this idea of soul deep burnout uh, that I talked about in the trailer of this podcast, it really comes down to cell deep burnout. The cells themselves are generators of energy. And if we cannot generate energy the way that we are designed to, then our structure starts to fail. And if you're able to start looking at many different things from that lens and you look at symptoms and disease as blockages of energy flow, whether that's from developmental factors, from hormonal factors, emotional factors, structural factors, mental factors, spiritual factors, it really allows you to expand your potential and expand your mindset and zoom out and see things for what they really are. If you see your metabolic function as kind of this deep hum, it is an expression of your life force or your sexual energy or sexual force, your fertility. They're all kind of one in the same, your creational force. If we are, if our energy flow is optimized, if we're living out to our energetic potential or up to our energetic potential, we're really able to fully embody our structure and integrate our essence, the essence of who we are into our physical body. They become one. But when we are not able to, when our metabolic function or our cellular function is low, it's very easy to become disembodied or disassociated. And it's hard to really be able to soak up all that is our existence. It's really hard to soak up the experience of being human. I think of like traditional Chinese medicine, they have the idea of chi or the, um, you know, Ayurvedic approach has the idea of prana or vata, or even like Persian medicine, they have the idea of rua, which is all of them have a word for this life force, this creative force, this sexual force that can get interrupted at any level, right? And I really see hormones as just a chemical expression of how we are able to embody 
our spirit, how we're actually able to integrate our spirit into our body. If we're at war with our spirit, if we're at war with the very essence of ourself, our energetic potential can only reach so high because we do not embrace all that we are. We, we have a hard time recognizing our energetic potential. How could we ever live up to it? And if you listen to that last episode, I shared a quote from the book, The Woman Who Run With Wolves. And I love that quote because I felt like it was a great representation of what it looks like when a woman is not living up to her energetic potential. And I thought it was just a beautiful quote, so well written and so well articulated. But taking that quote, we're going to really dive into how our body is a biofeedback machine for our energy, what's going on with our energy flow. And if our energy flow is poor, is blocked in many different ways, is not living up to its potential, then we're going to see real physical signs and symptoms, real emotional signs and symptoms. I, you know, if you think about the image that now is like kind of viral within the pro-metabolic community, I remember the first time I posted it in 2020 and it was like signs of an undernourished woman. And I remember it resonating so much with so many and it had things like overwhelmed and cold hands and cold feet and not having good digestion, having hair loss, having skin issues, not being able to sleep well, you know, all of just kind of the physical symptoms or the metabolic markers that we talk about in the pro-metabolic space. But I feel like it's an oversimplification to just define these things by metabolic markers because they are so much more than that. If we're looking at our metabolism as our ability to expand or live out our energetic potential, when we're experiencing these types of symptoms, it's really our body letting us know that something is wrong with our energy flow. You know, if the body is a biofeedback mechanism or being that is a reflection of what's going on on an energetic level. Remember, energy begets structure. If our structure is failing, the energy is is poor. Then it makes perfect sense that we would reflect that on the outside. So I think of when I, you know, when I think of the physical symptoms or the things that we have now kind of talked about as as signs of poor metabolic function. I think sometimes women can, I think sometimes we look at these things as, again, we oversimplify them and we look at things like body temperature and pulse and digestion and our metabolism as a whole is something we just need to fix. Like my metabolism is poor and I need to be fixed. And a lot of times, you know, a lot of women are attracted to Jessica Ash Wellness because of their hormonal symptoms. So many women right now are experiencing varying degrees of hormonal imbalances. And I am starting to see how when it comes to these metabolic markers or when we are changing our diet, changing our lifestyle, trying to do all the things and something still isn't budging, we have to look deeper. You know, a female body that has not reached its energetic potential to embrace its feminine essence fully. And what I mean by that is, you know, our feminine essence requires us to surrender to the rhythms and transitions of the female existence. We live inside a very rhythmic and dynamic cycle very different to our male counterparts, which we'll dive into very deeply in a later episode. But we often don't recognize how much we're resisting the song of the body. You know, I guess we can call it that. The the frequency and the vibration of our body is so out of alignment that every time we go through these transitions, we fight the change. And fighting the change or resisting the rhythm is the reason why our body is so out of balance, is so out of harmony with itself. Because if you think of a woman who feels unsafe, her body doesn't have what it needs, whether it's a stressful environment, whether she's not getting enough nutrition, whether she's over-exercising, her body thinks she's constantly running from an angry bear, whatever it might be, a lot of times we, we as women right now, especially with society as it is such a fear-based, structure-based, rule-based, negativity-based system, us women are stuck in various stages of fight, flight, fawn, or freeze. Whether we're you know fighting constantly, we're, we 
react to our stressors with aggression or we react to our stressors with retreat, right? We avoid people, we practice avoidance, we flight, we flee, or we fawn, right? We people please, we go above and beyond to make everything, everyone and everyone around us happy to try to manage the threat around us. Or we just are so exhausted and burned out that we just freeze. We're frozen, we lay on the couch, we watch Netflix, we disconnect from our life because we just don't have the energy anymore to be able to enjoy our experience. And if you think of a body that perceives itself in danger constantly, there's no stability, there's no safety. What happens is change can be incredibly difficult. We, we try to control everything. We try to stop the rhythm. We cannot surrender to the rhythms that we are required to surrender to if we want to live in flow and harmony and balance within our own physical body. A healthy body that is f- has fully embodied its feminine essence is able to jump up and protect itself when necessary. So jump into that fight or flight state, jump into that fawn state, jump, you know, jump into whatever state it needs to, whatever nervous system state it needs to, to protect itself and to get out of danger. But just as quickly, that body can refine its harmony quite qu- quickly and get back into the rhythm and the flow of nature. And what you're seeing right now amongst women as a whole, you know, their physical symptoms being an expression of the energy field beneath, what you're seeing is women can no longer stay in that harmonious vibrational frequency. They Their energy flow is blocked in so many different ways and they're stuck in this place that requires them to force everything. So I want to break down metabolic markers from this perspective, because I think most of you, you know, you've if you've been in the pro metabolic space for a long, uh, you know, a, a good period of time, you've probably heard metabolic markers defined. I've defined them in, uh, you know, my I have a free I had a free metabolic marker class. I had, uh, you know, I talk about these in Fully Nourished, but I think when you look at them from an energetic perspective, they can start to make a lot more sense. And I talked about in the last episode how when we look at health, oftentimes we can get caught up in, oh no, have has somebody changed their point of view or has somebody changed this or, oh no, more change. And what we have to look at we, what we have to look at health discoveries as as facets of a diamond where you might be looking at one facet and then you start to look at a different facet and it might seem different than the previous facet of the diamond but it's not it's just giving you a more you're starting to expand your view you're starting to expand your potential and see the many nuances that are there within health rather than flip-flop between different viewpoints there's room for every viewpoint as long as you have a good lens to view it through. And that's what bioenergetics gives us. And so when we look at metabolic markers from an energetic perspective, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people say, you know, you want to be warm, content, happy. There's a lot of focus on body temperature and pulses. And I I want you to understand why that is. A body that is maintaining its, its temperature in an optimal way is reflecting that the cells are generating energy appropriately. When there's fluctuations in the body temperature constantly, you know, you're waking up with very low body temperatures over the course of the day, they're jumping down and jumping up. You know, your food is really impacting your body temperature. You can't maintain it very easily yourself. There's a sign that there's some type of blockage in the energy flow, right? And this often is accompanied by women who cannot maintain their own body temperature. You know, they're often cold all the time. They feel maybe numb emotionally to life. They are uh, very cold in their extremities. Oftentimes like your hands and your feet will be really cold. The tip of your nose, your, your ears will be really cold. And this is a bigger representation of a body that on a cellular level cannot maintain its own energy flow. And on top of that, when we look at pulse rate, I know a lot of people get caught up in the minutiae of, of pulse, but When you look at pulse rate, you know, pulse rate is really a reflection of how the heart is beating blood throughout the body. And there's this very interesting article that I will link below in the show notes, just because I think it's a really powerful read if you have the time for it. But this woman, she proposed this paper. It's called A Study of the Human Energy Field. And she talked about how, you know, science has very much verified that the heart, every time it 
pumps or beats, it gives off a very powerful electromagnetic field. It goes about three feet in every single direction. The heart is an electrical organ. It, it gives off an electromagnetic field that is extremely powerful. And so when you think of pulse rate and blood as the way the body gets oxygen and nutrients to every tissue in our body, it would make sense that our pulse is a reflection of our energy or our electricity. And if our pulse rate is too low, it's a sign that our body is conserving energy. And this is why you often see very low pulse rates with women who are very cold, their extremities are very cold, they have hair loss. It's because their body is not pumping nutrients and oxygen flow at the rate that their body needs. And it's not getting to the extremities. It's kind of staying pooled within the body's survival systems. And then moving on to another metabolic marker. So, you know, body temperature and pulse is always talked about, but then we have the cycles, right? You know, having good progesterone production, having regular cycles that are not super symptomatic or super painful, but let's break that down on a little bit more of an energetic level. So when you look at, at the female cycle, it's a, it's a cycle that is di a dynamic rhythm. Every single day, there's a shift in hormones. No two days are the, the exact same. We'll dive into this way deeper in another episode. But I want to bring your focus to the fact that the cervix opens two times a month. So the cervix opens once to give you a physical release during menstruation, and it opens once to receive during ovulation. And it's interesting because thousands of years ago, it was believed that every time the cervix opened, a woman was connected to a different realm. She was connected to her source or her creator. She was one with mother nature or one with the mother of it all, the nurturer of creation and that this was necessary to be able to create life. So you've probably heard of the red tent idea or that women were kind of uh, pushed away to menstruate together in tents. But what a lot of people, what a lot of women don't understand is there was a deep belief that women were connected on a very spiritual level during that time, and they needed to have time away to be able to focus inward and to focus on this connection with the source of it all. And so the chemical expressions of going through this cycle, you know, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, our hormones themselves are chemical expressions of these transitions. When our hormones are in balance or these chemicals are in balance, it's really a reflection that the transitions are not happening in a rhythmic way. We are fighting the shifts of the transition. And I see so many women focusing on how do I fix my ovulation or how do I get my progesterone levels up or how do I do this or how do I do this? But sometimes we, it does require us to zoom out and look at it from an energetic level and see that these transitions, these rhythmic transitions as much of a sacrifice as they are for the body. They are incredibly energy intensive. This is why the female body requires so much energy and we don't run off on thin air. We, we do need to be nourished. We do need to have the right amount of food and nutrients to be able to go through these transitional shifts. But when a woman's energy is very low, she doesn't have the capacity to go through transitions with ease because transitions require change and shifts and shifts require energy. And so oftentimes, you know, when women have hormonal symptoms, PMS, fibroids, uterine issues, PCOS, endometriosis, you know, the list goes on and on. And I include, and I include myself in this too, because this is something that I have experienced in many different aspects of my health journey, is that there is not enough energy to go through transitions with ease, to surrender to the rhythm that is the feminine existence. And so our physiology begins to fight the change and fight the rhythm. And we stop going through these shifts in the way that we're supposed to. And these transitions become painful, right? And so one of the signs that we're reaching our energetic potential is that we go through harmonious transitions or shifts. We've, we are surrendered to the rhythm and the flow of the feminine existence. We are able to open up and release and have our physical release that is menstruation, but we're also able to open up and be quote unquote penetrated by the spark of life, which happens around ovulation. And it's a rhythm of both, right? There needs to be death and life, death and life. And the feminine existence is really a, a perfect reflection 
of the seasonal aspect of life itself. Another metabolic marker that you'll often hear talked about is libido, you know, like a diminished libido. But I kind of like to lump diminished libido into sexual appetite and also diminished fertility, because I think that they're all connected. Our libido is really our craving for reproduction in a sense. Um, it's a it's a undercurrent of our creative life force. Now, remember, reproduction is not the only way that humans co-create with the creator of the universe or the, or the source of it all. However, but oftentimes I like to use reproduction as a great physical example of that. But that doesn't mean that reproduction is everybody's uh, personal purpose in life. You know, it's often our biological purpose and the female body is really obsessed with reproduction. And you'll see that every single thing in the body revolves around this creative force, but it's not the only creative force we have, right? It's not the only things that we create. We create a lot. Um, We have the ability to create art and beauty and so many different things within our lives. But our, our sexual appetite or our libido is really a reflection of this creative life force. And when our energy is low and we're not living out our energetic potential, we're going to often see this diminished. And that's going to be a reflection of our fertility as well, in a sense, because our fertility is a product or an overspill of our creative life force. It is us having so much to give that it overflows and we pour into something else. Looking at another metabolic marker, I think of sleep as a big one. You know, how many people right now, especially women, are struggling with their sleep, whether it be waking up through the night, um, sleeping poorly, not being able to fall asleep or just having constantly racing thoughts while they're sleeping. But, you know, when you look at sleep, it's we even use the term falling to sleep. We have to fall into it. It's a vulnerable state of being. And going back to a woman who, when she doesn't feel safe, she doesn't feel stable, her body's kind of stuck in this fight, flight, fawn, freeze mode. It's going to be very difficult to fall into a vulnerable state like sleep is. Oftentimes, when you look at women who can't sleep well, it's because they've built such strong walls around them and they have such a false sense of control. They try to control everything around them, everything that's going on in their life, their health, their body. And so they cannot release that sense of control. And it's very difficult to fall into something when you're holding on so tightly. I think of another metabolic marker, you know, the having energy. You know, a lot of women right now are walking around just extremely exhausted. They have that wired and tired feeling where no matter how tired they are and how exhausted their body are, is their mind cannot rest. And they can't even acknowledge their need for rest. Even when they sit down to rest, their mind doesn't allow them to rest. Or, you know, you look at skin, how the outside of our body, our skin is our largest organ. Organs require energy. And our skin is a reflection of what's going on on a deeper layer, on a deeper on a deeper level. Or you look at digestion and how the gut is really there to not only just process food and nutrients, but it's there to actually process life's experiences. You know, more nerves live in the gut than in the brain and the spinal cord. And that's for a reason. It's because the gut is the processor of it all. And when you can't process your emotions and you can't process your life experiences because your energy is so low, right? When you're, you're en- when you're not living out your energetic potential and your energy is incredibly low, you're gonna have a very hard time processing emotions, which takes a lot of energy. And so the body is gonna store that for later and it's gonna store it in the tissues. And the gut is one of those places because it's waiting there to be processed until it's allowed to be processed. So this is why a lot of times digestion is referred to as another metabolic marker because it's another signal that, okay, something's going on 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 an energetic level and something is not working for me. Or I also think of detoxification and how many women struggle with, you know, MTHFR and the COMT and all of these, you know, quote unquote, genetic mutations and things that impair their detoxification. But detoxification is the representation of letting go of the things that no longer serve us, letting go, being able to let go. And it is so intertwined with the digestive system, because when we when our body is processing 
food, nutrients, its environment, its experiences, its emotions properly. It's taking what it needs and it's letting go of the rest. But how many of us don't have the energetic potential to do that? And so we're just holding on to everything and it's being stuffed into the fat cells and the tissues until we have the energy to be able to process it. And I even think of hair, you know, in that wonderful quote in Women Who Run With Wolves, she talks about I think she says a phrase that says that women are not meant to be puny with frail hair and the inability to leap up, the inability to chase, to birth, to create a life. And I found it really interesting that she put frail hair in there because I do think that our hair can oftentimes be a representation of our energetic potential on a on a much deeper level. When you look at the helix structure of the keratin protein, it's it's very fascinating. You can Google this. The helix structure of keratin is that circular structure, the same helix structure as our DNA. Our very DNA has the same circular structure as our as our hair does, the keratin within our hair. And I find that incredibly fascinating. So I, you know, I, I'm a big believer that our hair is a is a great reflection of the energy beneath. And that's a lot of times, I think, why it's included as as another metabolic marker within the pro-metabolic space. But I'm ready to take a deeper dive into these things instead of seeing them on a surface level, because I think so many women right now are stuck not knowing which direction to go, because maybe they've hit a wall a little bit and they it's, it's because they don't have the deep perspective that bioenergetics offers. They haven't taken the time or they haven't even been made aware that bioenergetics exists on a deeper level beyond what the quote unquote pro metabolic diet is teaching right now. It goes so much deeper than that. So as we start to see our physical symptoms as signs of something deeper on an energetic level, we often forget that our emotional and spiritual symptoms are sometimes more telling than our physical symptoms. When a woman is not operating at her energetic potential, you know, see the female body is an incredible creative force. It gives off a a huge amounts of energy and electricity. It has to generate huge amounts of energy to reach its biological and reproductive potential. And when it's not, the body can quickly and like in a snap of a second, right before your very eyes, go, go from being an energy generator to an energy black hole. And a big thing that I see right now You know, you can see it on social media. Yes, a a lot of people are very pretendy on social media. So sometimes it's hard to see through it. If you know what to look for, you can see it. But you have to be willing to look. And we also have to be willing to look at it in our own lives. And But you can definitely see it everywhere you go. I feel like no matter where I'm at, whether I'm like shopping at Walmart or Home Goods or at the grocery store, I just see a bunch of energetic black holes. And what I mean by that is when you look around and you see how women are behaving, it can give us great insight as to where their energy state is. So the biggest one that I think stands out the most to me right now is the kind of girl boss archetype The I, I call it forcibly creating momentum. So you can see right now that women are getting increasingly exhausted with the total, like the, the girl boss mentality, the, the hustle culture, but that kind of permeates into the woman who is kind of always busy. She can never sit down. She always has to be doing something. She's always working towards something. She's always pushing, forcing, striving towards some type of goal. Um, She's become addicted to the hormones that keep momentum going, keep the energy going or generate heat in the body. Doesn't that make sense? So if a woman is addicted to adrenaline or cortisol, kind of these concepts we talk about and we'll talk about more in the next episode, these are hormones that will generate heat at an expense to the physical structure. And it makes sense that women right now, because they're hurting so badly for energy, their energy is blocked in so many ways. They're not living up to their energetic potential. They need to do whatever they can to get as much energy as possible, whether that's sucking energy from other people or it is breaking down their own structure to generate heat. And that's what so many women are doing. You see this a lot with women who are addicted to exercise, can never take a day off. They, they for whatever reason, they cannot 
part with their exercise addiction or their connection to exercise. And I think sometimes people see that only as an issue, like a mindset issue or something mental that has to be worked through. But I think a lot of times it is very physical as well, because the hormones that are generated when you're exercising like mad can feel really good when you're hurting for energy. They can generate heat, even if it's in a way that doesn't serve your serve your body in the long run. I also think of this kind of, uh, you know, when you look at a woman who's stuck in fight or flight, she's going to always be seeing things from the negative. She's always going to be nitpicky, picking the negative aspects of her environment out constantly. Sometimes she'll even create drama. She'll she'll try to create drama because again, drama, although chaotic, bad energy, it will still be some type of energy. And remember, a woman operating out you know, not within her energetic potential is going to feel like she needs to create some type of energetic force around her. So this is why you often see women who are operating from this place as they they often get very addicted to drama or like dramatic things, right? Um, it's very difficult to maintain positivity when you're in a low energy state because it does require energy to maintain positivity. It's very easy to be negative. It's very much human nature to jump to the negative because you're always scanning for threats. You're always scanning for what is not safe. And so you often see that when you're you're not living up to your energetic potential, you're going to be very, very negative. Um, there's another you know aspect of it to being driven by fear and worry. When you are stuck energetically, you're going to see everything from a place of lack because it goes back to being stuck in that survival state. It's always about your safety. It's always about your stability, that there is never enough because you're an energetic black hole and you have a hard time tapping into your intuitional power of are things really okay because you're just driven by constant fear and worry. And in that, a lot of women are susceptible to restriction, restriction, restrictive diets being a perfect example of that. Instead of seeing food from how does it feel? How does it make me feel? Does it make me feel warm and content and happy? Um, what does my intuition say about it? What does my gut say about it? It's just like, this is bad for me. It's dangerous. It's a danger. Scanning for danger. Danger. Don't eat it. And this is where a lot of women who follow extremely restrictive diets are coming from. Another emotional representation of a woman who's not living out to her, up to her energetic potential is someone who's triggered all the time. You know, someone who takes everything personally because again, everything is a threat. Everything is a threat to her existence. And women who don't have the energy to process or bear their own emotions will often do the the easy thing and project project it back onto you. This is why you see so many women right now being incredibly reactionary. I think of what I like to call the Karen archetype where, and I feel bad for people whose name is Karen because I'm sure there are Karens out there that are really kind and compassionate and loving and their names have gotten a bad rap. But you think of like that, you know, what people call Karens, where they're just resentful and angry and bitter and they take out everything on the people around them because they do not have the energy to process their own emotions, process their anger, their bitterness and their rage. Their rage has no outlet. It just stores up until it pours out. And this is why you see women operating from a what I call ragey or cagey. They're either raging their way through life or they're cagey. They avoid everything. They avoid social interaction. They're just avoidant of everything because they, again, they don't have the energy to process what it takes to deal with other people. Another sign of a woman not reaching her energetic potential is something that I saw a lot when I was within the evangelical church. And it was mental inflexibility. So it's a, a kind of a closed off, very black and white thinking, like it's either good, bad, no in-betweens, no nuance. Everything is a threat. And I kind of think about right now, like what's going on in the health and wellness world. I, you know, it's interesting to see how some Sometimes people that are so immersed in the health and wellness space are actually some of the most unhealthy women that I've ever seen. And I think it goes back to their they're not living up to their energetic potential. Everything is a threat. They're living within this very fear and worried space and they're trying to control everything. They're trying to control their future. They're trying to control 
everything that goes on in their life, everything that goes on in their body. And we as women are meant to do exactly the opposite, to live in a place of surrender and trust and surrendering to the flows and rhythms of life. And it can be an incredibly uh, energy draining place to be when everything is a perceived threat. But all of the emotional states I just mentioned are really a lot of times more associated with that kind of fight or flight state. But now I'm moving more into that numb state. Like if you're familiar with the polyvagal theory, this is really this more numb part of that where the body has gone through burning as much energy as possible, generating as much heat and energy from whatever place as possible just to survive. And it's gotten to a place where it can no longer do that. And it has to start conserving energy. And this is a really scary place, I think, that a lot of women end up in. I was here for a really long time time. And now I can recognize it as hindsight is 2020, but it's a very disconnected and disassociated place, a place where you're not really connected to your own experience anymore. You don't, you're not really able to be penetrated by the pleasure or the joy or the beauty of life anymore. And you have become very cut off from your body. So you're cut off from your own needs. You're unaware of your own needs and you can't even communicate your needs because how can you communicate your needs if you don't even know what they are? And this often will express itself in a lot of indecisiveness. Um, it can also express itself from a people pleasing point of view where you don't have the energy to maintain your boundaries anymore. You don't have the energy to say no and to protect yourself against other people's emotions that are not really your problem, but you're going to have to set boundaries with. And so you just constantly say yes and you constantly people please because you can't say no. You don't have the energy to maintain your boundaries. Um, this can often you know, express itself as overwhelm too because you're saying yes to everyone. You really don't have the energy to deal with anyone. <laughs> and so you're just so completely overwhelmed and burned out because of course you are. Of course you are. And this leads us to being kind of further cut off or closed off or checked out or disassociated. We really don't want to even deal with people anymore. You know, a lot of people right now think they're introverts, but in reality, they're just so low energy. Their nervous systems are fried and they're not living out to their energetic potential. Of course, they can't deal with people. They can barely deal with their own existence and their own experience because they don't have the energy to process it. And this is the state that really leaves us to a place of, of a physiological state called learned helplessness. Now, if you've been in the bioenergetic or pro-metabolic world for a period of time, you've probably heard of this concept, learned helplessness. But I think sometimes it just gets like it gets kind of, again, oversimplified. And I like to see it from a more energetic point of view as when you've gotten to this place where you're so numb, you're so disassociated, you're so closed off to your own experience, you become super susceptible and helpless to dogmatic thinking. Because if you don't have the energy to think for yourself, you're going to start blindly accepting authority and even more, you're going to start accepting authority from people that should not have authority over you. And you start to live within someone else's vision, whether that be what an influencer's life is, or that's, I think that's a big one right now, where you start to just, you don't really take any personal responsibility for what you want or what your goals are. You just kind of blindly accept other people's viewpoints and start living somebody else's life, somebody else's version of happy which will never make you feel good and will never make you feel aligned in any possible way. It will never make you feel that connected creative life force that you so desire. And I am the first one to admit that personal responsibility and taking responsibility for ourselves, our health, what we want, our, our vision for our life, it takes so much energy and it takes so much work. And if we are operating at this very low energy level, how is it possible for us to even get there to the point where we have the energy? So of course we are stepping into everything we do, including health, including our healing journey with this just kind of blind acceptance to authority and falling prey to other people's vision. The foundation of bioenergetics is really to perceive, think, act, to have your own perception or your own viewpoint or your own experience, and then to think about it and to really marinate about it and challenge your belief system. And then once you feel like it is worth acting upon, you then act. And right now what we're doing is we're just acting with reckless abandon without even 
thinking for a second because we a lot of us don't have the energy to think for ourselves. And this is the state that so many women find themselves in. If any of this resonated with you, I know it resonates with me. I know it resonates with not just myself, but my friends and the people that I know and the women that I know in my life, where women as a collective have gotten to this place where we've we find ourselves totally abandoning ourselves. We we have totally abandoned ourselves, our boundaries, our needs, who we are, what we're made for, for someone else's vision of our life. We have allowed someone else to make the decisions for us that were meant for us to make for ourselves. We as women, we have physiology that's that is meant to generate so much energy that we have the ability to generate our own vision and create our own vision for our life using our imagination, the power of our imagination and our own unique gifting and viewpoint and perspectives. And this, this is why bioenergetics is so important. Yeah, the hormone stuff is cool. Yeah, feeling better and having more energy is cool. Yes, feeling a higher quality of life. But when we start with nourishment, when we start with meeting our own physical needs, you know, feeding ourselves well, giving ourselves the, the sleep that we need, giving ourselves the rest that we need, becoming our own nurturers and re-nurturing ourselves back to life in a way, you know, this is why, in my opinion, it does start with nourishment because all of these concepts, you know, whatever you resonated with today or whatever you maybe felt disconnected to today, that's okay. I think so many of us are at this place where we're just so burned out and so disassociated that we have no idea where to start. All this stuff maybe sounds cool, but we're not even there yet. And that's okay. That's why nourishment is so powerful because when we meet ourselves where we're at and we start really focusing on meeting our basic human needs, like getting what our cells need on a physical level, oftentimes it will it will get us to a point where we are generating enough energy or our cells are working on a better level or our metabolism is working on a better level that it allows us to start opening up and softening to life. And that's where we're going to find ourselves kind of rising higher towards that higher self or the person that we're meant to be we were created to be. And this is why I believe nourishment is so powerful. I know it can seem like a very simple thing to, you know, eat for energy and to give our body the protein and carbs and fats and nutrients it requires, but it's not simple. It is spiritual. And nourishment has the power to change energy, and that energy has the power to create structure. So as we wrap this episode up, you know, I want to remind you that It's important to marinate on the idea that energy and structure are interdependent on every level. That is really the foundation of the bioenergetic point of view or the philosophy, you can call it. Uh, Looking at the body, it's the lens in which we view the body. And remember that your energy or remember that all energy, it follows emotion, attention, and focus. So where thought goes, energy flows. And if you believe like I do, that energy is the source of all that is, is... I am is God. It to me, it's really interesting because it shows that as energy follows emotion, attention and focus, it shows us that God is very interested in what we're doing and wants to be a part of it and finds joy or pleasure or maybe even humor in being a part of whatever we're doing. So that energy that follows focus, follows attention, follows thought, Whatever it is about that energy is interested in us as humans, is uh, is interested in little old me. And I find that way powerful. That's a, a, an incredibly life-changing thought. And I hope that today's episode, if it taught you anything else, I feel like it maybe was all over the place. Or like I said before, it was just going to be projectile vomit of all of these things that I find just incredibly fascinating. I hope that you re- recognize how you think about your body and believe about yourself and believe about your body is going to completely impact you on an energetic and metabolic level. And I think a lot of women in the metabolic space have hit their glass ceiling in a sense. They keep, they keep hitting a wall because they're not thinking of themselves clearly. They still haven't grasped how powerful they really are. And when we start with nourishment on just a physical level, 
it allows us to start with something tangible that we have control over. And that food really goes down to the cell level and starts to energize the spirit. And then once the spirit is energized, the essence of who we really are can start to integrate with our physical body. And that really allows us to live up to our creative potential and become who we were made to be. Thank you so much for listening to the Fully Nourished podcast. I hope today's episode about bioenergetics resonated with you. And if you're looking to explore the pro-metabolic diet and kind of expand on what we talked about in today's episode, I highly recommend checking out the next episode, which is where we're going to be diving into that. Thank you so much for listening to the Fully Nourished podcast. As a thank you for being so supportive during the launch of the podcast, I just want to let you know that Fully Nourished is 25% off for podcast listeners using the discount code FNPOD. Again, that is FNPOD. And that discount is available for you until August 4th. I hope today's episode about bioenergetics and exploring the energetic potential of the body really resonated with you. And if you're looking to explore nutrition from a bioenergetic perspective, I highly recommend checking out the next episode, which is going to be all about diving into the pro-metabolic diet and taking a really no-holds-barred approach to breaking down that viewpoint and breaking through the myths and the misconceptions and the ins and outs. I cannot wait to see you then.